Hello everyone, welcome to the Artemis Agile Consulting YouTube channel. My name is Bill DeVoe, I'm the Principal Enterprise Agile Coach here at Artemis. And today I wanna to talk about using cumulative flow diagrams. This is going to be one of our short form videos, um, just a quick introduction to CFDs, and I hope that you will find it useful. Some of the typical Agile metrics that we use for how our teams are doing are things like burn down charts, which are going to show us the number of issues or the number of story points remaining for a team to complete. They usually include an ideal line between where you start off and where you end. Most of the time, your teams will be above that ideal line. I generally don't use burn down charts in my team metrics simply because I don't find them terribly informative. I do like the burn up chart as it does show that the team is completing work during the course of the time box, whether it's a sprint or iteration. For simplicity, I'll just be using the term sprint to describe those time boxes for the rest of this video. The burn up chart gives you a good idea of how much work the team is completing during the sprint. It should show a slow, steady progression from zero all the way through the total number of issues or story points that the team is committed to. Ideally, your burn up chart will show progress every day. You don't want to see a huge uptick at the end of the sprint where all of the items have been accepted and you go from zero all the way up to the total number of items. Another metric is going to be your completed versus your committed percentage. And this is the amount of work that was delivered at the end of the sprint versus how much work was committed at the beginning of the sprint. It's really important that this number be between 80 and 100%, perhaps even up to 105% if the team found that they were able to complete some work early and had additional capacity to bring some other work in. I would be very cautious about any percentages that go over about 105% because that may be indicative of an anti-pattern for the team where they do not feel comfortable committing to work that they are clearly capable of delivering. And so I would be talking to the team about why our committed was so much below are completed. A couple of good lean metrics to look at are going to be your throughput and your cycle time. Throughput is simply a measure of the number of items that were completed and delivered during that sprint. Cycle time is simply a measure of how much time it took from the moment you began working on an item until that item was completed and accepted. So it can tell you how long on average your team takes to actually work and deliver on an item. When you're looking at lean metrics like throughput and cycle time, one expectation is that those items are going to be about the same size. So you may need to do some normalization based off of the size of the items that you guys are doing. If you are doing large items, that cycle time will likely be much higher than if you're doing very small items. This should though encourage your teams to break down items into smaller pieces so that you can do more consistent delivery of value. So a cumulative flow diagram is simply a visualization of the work as it flows through the different work steps of your flow. In this particular for example, you can see we have five steps. These are all based off of Rally Software's implementation with backlog, ready, in progress, completed, and accepted. You'll see that there's not a design, build, test, kind of structure here. It is very straightforward in that in progress includes all of those things. We are trying to avoid creating the silos between development and test on our teams. Breaking them out on our workflows tends to reinforce that thought process and that mindset. So I'm very cognizant about not doing that if I can avoid it. I like to see all of that sort of bundled up into an in progress state that does have some implications in that development and test need to be happening simultaneously in that in progress state. State. There are no substates here. So the team will have to be working on everything all of the time in that work step. I will add that the cumulative flow diagram is my favorite metric. It is a very quick visualization to show you how work is flowing. And I like the anti-patterns that can be identified when we look at these. So the basic elements of your CFD are your different work steps. In this case, we have our ready, design and build are broken out as two separate work steps. And then we have complete, which is all the items that have been accepted by our product owner. You can tell how much work is to be done just simply based off of the size of the purple area here. You can tell the amount of work that's in progress by simply seeing how many are in your in progress states. And you can see that you have a good burn up 
or not based on where your work done chart is showing. This is an example that I would say is how not to read a CFD. This is actually from the Scaled Agile Framework RTE class, and this is showing the program Kanban for an Agile release train or a team of teams. But what they're trying to show here is the work in progress on the left, yet it doesn't include the implementing stage. They're showing throughput, which is the amount of work that you would do during any particular iteration or sprint. And then lead time, which actually is not lead time, it's cycle time. Lead time is a different lean metric, which is the time it takes from an item to come into our backlog, i.e. to be requested by the customer until we deliver it to the customer. Cycle time is the amount of time that we work on an item. So from the moment we start working on an item until the time we deliver it, that is our cycle time. Be cautious, there are some bad representations out there of what cumulative flow diagrams will tell you and what what you can divine from a CFD. So let's take an example of a cumulative flow diagram for a team that is not doing well. And we'll talk about this. So what's wrong here? Well, everything went into progress very quickly. We have 20 items and by day two, none of those items were still marked as ready. Everything was in some level of being worked on. We have lots of work in progress. In fact, by day five, we still have all 20 items at some state of being in progress. We have a lot of incomplete work at the end of the sprint. Almost all of those items weren't completed. And we end up with a low delivered versus committed. We can see there that we have less than 50% of the items we committed to were actually delivered at the end of the sprint. So you can see how a CFD can very quickly show you a lot of different anti-patterns that may be present with your teams. So here's another example. What do we think is wrong with this one? Well, the first thing, we added new work. We went from 20 items to 25 items and we never even got close to finishing the first 20. So we added work to our sprint for some reason, and yet we never got to it. We have different points during the sprint where we starved our build state. We had work that was being done and then suddenly it wasn't done. Maybe it moved to complete, but we didn't have a good flow of work through our system. Instead, we had times where we were too busy focusing on design and not working on trying to move work through our system. And again, our completed versus delivered was low. It was probably in the 80% range, but it was still not quite what we were looking for. For this example, I'd like you guys to pause the video here and take your own notes on the things that you think are wrong with this cumulative flow diagram. And then unpause the video and we'll talk about the results together. Okay, so the first thing that we have is that we're removing work. So we've committed to work almost 24 points, We've added work, we've removed work, we've added work, we've removed work, all of those things, we are seeing a huge change in the amount of work that the team has available in their sprint backlog. That is an anti-pattern we wanna recognize. Number two, we have starvation. We have a starvation of the build state in day three. We have a starvation of the design state in day five. So we wanna be cautious about that. Again, we're looking to flow work through the system so that we can have a good opportunity to complete work and deliver it. And that's our goal, to stop starting and start finishing because starting work doesn't have value to our customers. Finishing work does. So delivering something to our customer is our end goal. And that is how we wanna be measuring how we are doing. Number three, we have a dip in the complete. Something happened, something got pulled back out. It was marked as not complete and moved back into a different state. We generally don't like to see things move out of complete. Number four, we have a lot of items that are still incomplete, especially at the end of the sprint. We have a lot of items that are in build and a lot of items in design. Both of those states, again, are started but not finished. It's better to have almost everything marked as ready at the end of the sprint rather than in an active state like design or build in this case. And number five, you can see we were still adding more work to the sprint, even though it was very clear by looking at this chart that we were not gonna be able to deliver what we'd already committed to or what was currently in progress. So adding more work, even late in the sprint, again, an anti-pattern we want to address. And then again, finally, number six, a lot of work that wasn't completed. Our completed versus committed percentage is very low here. So we want to be aware of that and talking to the team, what can we do differently next time? All right, now let's look at what an almost ideal quote unquote CFD would look like. The first thing, 
work is not started until there's capacity. So we're going to have a lot of things that are marked as ready and not started until we have the ability to actually start working on things. Number two, we have what's called low WIP or low work in progress. What we want to be doing actually is limiting the amount of work that we are doing at any given time to just a small number of items. It does sound slightly counterintuitive because you think, oh, if we're working on multiple things at the same time, we can complete multiple things at the same time. The answer is we really can't. And multiple studies have shown this over the decades. We just need to recognize that lower work in progress means higher throughput, more items completed during the course of the sprint. Also, we're focusing our efforts on completing a few things and then moving on to the next thing. So low whip is incredibly important for getting good flow of work through your teams. Number three, very good acceptance for completed work. We're talking to our product owner on a regular basis. We're demonstrating the work that we've completed and they are accepting it. So we have a good good burn up chart, a good slope on our completed graph. And then number four, the team delivered all their commitments. It's possible that if the team hits this point and they say, hey, look, we can stretch a little bit. Let's add a couple of stories or a couple of points of stories. That is a possibility and the team can strive for that. But we do want to make sure that the team is trying to get as close to 100% of delivered versus committed as possible. So again, you want to have that band pretty tight. You don't want it to be very much above 100%. Again, 105 is okay over that. I would take a critical look at it. And then also if you're in the 80 to 100% range, then you're actually doing very well as a team. So applaud yourselves for that. So some good team practices to keep in mind. Number one, limiting your work in progress. That's gonna help your workflow. It's gonna help value flow to your customers. And that's the critical part. That's what we're trying to do. A bit controversial is how to pick that initial starting point for your work in progress limit. Some teams I've talked to have wanted to set it for two times N, where N is the number of people on the team doing work, i.e. your devs and testers. But I would really focus on N minus one. This has two benefits. Number one is that it means that one person is sort of a floater at any given point and can help out where needed. Number two, it's gonna mean that people have to work together, which means you're going to have a lot of knowledge sharing. And that's going to be really critical for when you want to get into those performing and high performing states on Tuckman's maturity model. But N minus one is going to cause a ruckus because that means that not everyone is going to have their own story. And that may be a bit of a challenge. Your mileage may vary. Check with your team on how they feel about that, but challenge them to think about how they could make it work. And number two here, making sure the team doesn't change the scope unless they're completing all their committed work. Again, if you're getting a good burn up on your completed work and your team is doing very well, you can absolutely explore bringing more work into the sprint. But don't bring more work in because there's pressure to do so. If your team is not going to deliver all their commitments, adding more work is not going to make it any better. And it will just make it worse for your team from a metrics perspective. So protect them from that kind of thrash by not doing that. So a quick note about JIRA cumulative flow diagrams. Out of the box, JIRA is going to show your entire project history. And so you're going to get a chart like this. Even if you limit your chart to just show a sprint, as I've done here, you can see that it's only showing from the 9th of March to the 22nd of March. That's a two week window. But what I'm getting are all of the issues in the project and the state that they are in between those two dates. And there's over 1500 issues in here, meaning there's a lot of things that you can't see. It's a lot of variation in the individual work states that you can't analyze because you can't visualize it. You can't see it here. So there's too much completed work. There's too much to do work on here. This chart is not terribly legible. There is a solution, however. I do have a whole process on my blog, which I will leave a link to below, on how to create a query to limit the focus to just the current sprint so that you can see the work that is being done and get cumulative flow diagrams like you have seen earlier in this presentation. You have to create a query to limit the scope, change the start and end dates to reflect your time box, and then of course set any sharing settings if you want others to view it. You also may want to limit the issue types that are available. Those are opportunities for you when you're editing that query to make those adjustments and get the filter that you want for the items that you're looking for. So just some closing thoughts about CFDs. They are very powerful. I love them. I think that they're very valuable. They're one of the things that I like to review with Scrum Masters, product owners, release train engineers, if I'm doing a safe implementation. It's a very good way to find some common anti-patterns to get a clear visual of the team performance over time for the sprint. Or if you're using Scaled Agile, you can look at it over the course of the PI, but you get to see how things are flowing, how work is being completed and delivered. It's also easy to compare sprint over sprint performance. So you can look back at previous 
previous sprints and see how the team did and how they're doing today. You can begin to identify what improvements you've made through retrospective and how those are turning into improvements for your value delivery. The amount of effort to create a CFD varies based on the software. Um, Rally and version one do that sprint level CFD very easily out of the box. Jira does require some extra setup, but all of that software can be used to do this. You can also do this manually. There are some templates available, but those templates can let you do this. You just simply check the state of all the stories at the end of the day, record their current state, and then that can create a CFD for you manually. So you're not stuck with having to use the software if you don't want to. It is possible to do it by yourself without having to go through the software. Thank you so much for watching this short about cumulative flow diagrams. If you have any questions about cumulative flow diagrams or anything agile, please feel free to reach out to us. You can check out our website at artemisagile.com and please make sure to like, subscribe, and then click the bell icon to get notified when I post up new videos. Thank you again. Have a great day.